Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Nice to see you. Nice to, Jerry, nice to see you too. Uh, today, Miners Hall Museum is pleased to welcome Julia Patterson. Uh, she's been all over the state so far and it's <laughs> going to continue that way, but she's author of Sinkhole. The book is right over here A Legacy of Suicide. This event is held in conjunction with Pitt State's Writers Fest and is co-sponsored by the Pittsburgh State University's Women's Studies Lecture Series, Distinguished Writers, Visiting Writers Series, and the Student Fee Council. Juliet's book, which deals with the legacy and inheritance of suicide in one American family, is also a deep look into her roots here. She visited and researched Southeast Kansas, giving special interest to the abandoned mines and extensive undermining as well as the sinkholes to gather historical evidence and imagine the final days of her maternal and paternal grandfathers. One, fiery, one was a fiery pro-labor politician and the other a melancholy businessman. Both died by their own hand as did her father in Minneapolis. The book provides an intriguing look at not only her family history in Southeast Kansas, but also an outsider's look at the unfolding story here of immigration, coal mining, labor disputes, and commerce. Sinkhole was a finalist for the 2023 Minnesota Book Awards and was named one of the best memoirs of 2022 by Library Journal. She was also published, she has also published two full-length poetry collections, Trinity and the Truant Lover, both of which have been recognized with multiple literary awards. As a community activist and artist, Patterson has worked on a number of collect collaborative projects related to placemaking and the environment. She lives in Minneapolis, where she teaches creative writing and literature at St. Olaf College and is director of the college's environmental conversations program. Please welcome our guest today, Juliet Patterson. Can you all, can you all hear me? Is that working? Okay. Um, thank you all for being here. It's so nice to be in this museum because um, when I first started doing research in Pittsburgh, this was one of the first places I came. Um, I'm going to talk for a little bit about kind of the genesis of this book project and then do a little reading and then maybe we have time for a question and answer. Um, so as Linda already said, this project began really with the death of my father by suicide in 2008. So I'm a native Minnesotan. My parents were married in the 50s and they left Kansas, but I have three generations of family on both sides that lived in Pittsburgh. So they were really the only people from that whole extended family who left. Um, and they were a little bit estranged from this town so I didn't spend a lot of time here as a child. I didn't know it very well. Uh, and as Linda also said, I have two grandfathers who also died by suicide. The first is my father's father, Edward. He was uh, in the House of Representatives two terms um, during the New Deal era, as described a very fiery liberal Democrat, very pro-labor, um, very charismatic individual. And then my mother's father, William McCluskey, who came from a coal mining family. His, he was the youngest of um, eight children. All the boys in that family worked in the mines here in Pittsburgh or nearby. And um, by the time William came of age, the, the mines were already in decline. So he sort of escaped that path. He went to school at Pittsburgh Business College, which existed, is that the accurate name? I think so. Yeah. Which, um, and he had a mentor there who encouraged him to kind of go into some sort of business. He ended up at Pittsburgh Pottery, 
Um, and the records of Pittsburgh pottery, at least in terms of administrative, are a little spotty, um, but the family tells a story of him being a manager at some point of the Pittsburgh pottery. Um, but I can't definitively prove that. But he did work there for a number of years um, and eventually worked for a refinery outside of town uh, that was run by Shell Oil. Um, so they both have deep ties to this land. And because of the manner in which these men died, my family didn't discuss them, nor neither their lives and certainly not their deaths. Um, and so when my father died, it really felt like I felt compelled to kind of unearth their story. Um, I'm going to just contextualize a little bit about suicide that isn't the thrust of my talk. We're at the Miners Museum, and I'll talk more about sort of the environmental um, conundrum of the mining that was done here and the legacy of that. But, um, you know, this story is not unique. Uh, 44,000 people die by suicide every year in America. And for every person who dies by suicide, there's 115 people that are exposed to that suicide. And of that 115, 25 people will have major life disruptions after that death. It varies anywhere from divorce to um, chronic you know, alcohol problems or health problems. Uh, but it's, I just offer these statistics to remind us that um, this is a much bigger problem than our culture is able to really talk about at this point. And it was one of the motivations for writing the book. Um, after or very near the end of writing this book, I read an, a fascinating book by two economists um, called Deaths of Despair and the Future of Capitalism. Anne Case and Angus Deaton got interested in uh, some statistics they read about Americans experiencing high levels of pain. And when they started to unearth that pain, they discovered that in America, over the last 25 years, we've had an, an increasingly shorter life life expectancy. Uh, and that hasn't happened in, I think, 50 years, roughly. We're the only industrialized nation where that's true. Um, and so this book really started to begin investigating what is causing that. Among uh, deaths of despair, the highest number is white males, mostly college uneducated, between the ages of 55 and 75. But here are some things that they determined are potentially uh, causing some of these deaths. Um, and here I'm just saying that I'd like to say that suicide in my mind is a constellation of a number of factors, some of which are deeply personal and some of which we may never know when we're talking about an individual. But because uh, suicide is such a taboo topic, and we're not good at talking about it. Um, we certainly aren't very good at looking the, at the social conditions which might surround or contribute to these kinds of deaths. Uh, and I offer this list because outside of healthcare, um, these are all things in my mind that contributed to both my grandfather's death and my father's death. And we're talking about 100 years of history because Edward Patterson died in 1940 and my father died in 2008. Um, but the weakening position of labor, so I probably don't have to tell, there's many historians in the room, but this area was a hotbed of labor disputes. Um, coal mining itself, I think we owe uh, a, a debt to coal mining as an industry for the kinds of things that the labor movement did for, lar for workers at large. Um, but we know in Pittsburgh there was a story of uh, a systematic um, effort to weaken labor movements, right? And that's an old story. And that can cause a lot of mental stress and physical stress on those who are on the front lines, the workers. Um, the growing power of corporations, of course, we're now at a point in history when we're seeing like really inflated 
uh, power, corporate power. In my grandfather's day, um, it, it wasn't quite the same, but there's a similarity. Um, social isolation, loneliness, and pain. And the last point, a sort of unequal meritocracy, a kind of, um, you know, and I would say all three of the men in my family uh, aspired to that American dream, to kind of making themselves better, to, to providing for their family, to living up to these expectations, which may, they may or may not have been as successful as they would like. Um, and I just have questions about how deeply those narratives influence us. So to get back to the grandfathers, um, I, I sort of described their characters. Uh, they both arrived here at roughly the same time, and they're roughly the same age. And I have no one really knows if they knew each other, but one imagines they must have in some way, the way people do in a small town. Um, but my father, late in life, um, was interested in his own father, Edward, and had begun his own investigation of Edward's death in particular. Uh, he had a small collection of newspaper articles and had come to the conclusion that Edward might have been murdered. You'll have to read the book to learn more. <laughs> but um, when I first started coming to Pittsburgh to do research, Edward was kind of my focal point obviously because my father had just died, it's a direct lineage, but also I felt like I wanted to get to the heart of this mystery. And so I came to your beautiful town, Pittsburgh. Um, and even though my mother's side of the family was a coal mining family, and I knew that, I had no idea the extent um, to which coal was such an important part of this town um, and or the surrounding area. And as I tell in the book, about two years after my father died, so I was making multiple trips here, coming here very often, every few months, and doing a lot of research just for my own benefit. But about two years after my father died, I took a trip to my grandmother's house, my father's mother's house, um, just spontaneously, and across the street, kitty corner, there was a house that had been lifted up on crib and beams because a gigantic sinkhole had erupted in the yard. I didn't have enough presence to take photos at, at the moment, but these are the remediation photos provided by the mining surface unit. Um, this is Gloria Ortel's house, is that how you say her last Ertley. name? Ertley, Ertley. And as I've just learned today, JT and Linda live very near this house. I didn't know that. I, JT and I spoke a few times during the production of the book, and I wish I had known that because I would have asked him more questions. Um, I'm a poet primarily. Uh, as a writer, I identify as a poet. And this felt like a physical manifestation of a metaphor that I couldn't ignore. I'm not from around Southeast Kansas, so sinkholes are unfamiliar to me. And I was in a state of grief, and it was terrifying to stand in front of that hole. Um, but the metaphor for me works in many ways, the first of which at the time was a metaphor for my own grief, um, just standing in front of this abyss that I wasn't sure would ever go away. Secondly, it was a metaphor maybe most potently for my father's life, um, on the surface, everything looked fine. What, I never knew this was coming, right? But that one day, everything fell out from beneath him, and consequently me. Um, and, but thirdly, for suicide itself, just as a, a phenomena, I quote a geologist in the book who says that sinkholes are voids rising to the surface. And to me, that seems like a really beautiful, apt description of suicide itself. Beyond all that, this encounter with this sinkhole um, led me into even deeper research in regards to mining. 
because Pittsburgh is remediated, as many of you know, I didn't understand how much, uh, how many vast portions of the town were undermined, nor did I understand how it might have once looked. So what happened next is I started researching <laughs> sinkholes in and around the neighborhood. This is in Galena, um, Kansas. And here's a picture uh, from 1967 in Weir, Kansas, nearby, which just Weir happens to be the site of my grandfather's death. And so um, I was fixated. So that is a huge sinkhole. Um, my, parent, my grandparents on my mother's side, the story goes, eloped in Miami, Miami, Miami. So uh, in addition to sort of researching these sinkholes and actually driving around this landscape outside of Pittsburgh, which I had never really done, uh, I decided to drive to Miami. And of course, I ended up you know, driving to Pitcher and understanding the magnitude, uh, again, of the Tri-State Mining District. For all of you locals, this is very familiar, but again, I am an outsider, and I didn't understand how vast this industry really was in the turn of the century. And now that I've been around the state a little bit, I'm surprised to learn that there are many other Kansians in parts of the western part of the state, for example, who don't know that either. Yeah. Uh, it's astounding, I mean, because um, it's astounding. And the legacy of it, has, it's for me is, um, you know, made Pittsburgh a very unique place in that you're still here. You still have a vibrant town. You have multiple generations of families who have stayed here, which is remarkable. I can't, I don't think that's common in America in general. Um, in other words, this wasn't a bus town. Somehow you, you still stayed together, even though the industry left. Uh, so, of course, I went to Galena um, and looked at a lot of smelter sites in Pittsburgh. So, kind of digging into the, you know, the areas around here that are still pretty ravaged, um, but are, we're trying to fix. And then, of course, um, Pitcher itself. Yeah. Um, and this was all on the same trip that I saw the sinkhole. <laughs> Uh, so this becomes, you know, a pretty big environmental thread in the book. Um, and I, I was a little nervous coming to Pittsburgh to, and talking about this, but I think what Pittsburgh has also done well is to acknowledge um, the truth of this history, but also, you know, embrace what's positive about this town. So in other words, this hasn't entirely ruined Pittsburgh, Kansas. It did ruin Pitcher, Oklahoma. as you all know, um, but that there are sites like this all over the country. And part of my interest in telling this story is to get us to think about that social practice of extraction and how it has cost us um, both land and lives. And that as we go forward, um, potentially in an energy transition, which we may need to do, um, that we start to think about those things. So I, I said to Linda before coming here that um, I am by no means a historian, <laughs> like many that are in the room. Uh, and I, I don't know that I offer expertise as a historian, um, but I do offer, I guess, just a layman's perspective on learning about a place. And I'll just say a couple more things about what it was like to come here and learn about Pittsburgh, and then I'll do a little bit of reading. So sort of beyond acquainting myself with my ancestral home, um, it felt like in the early years that I was here, it was a place where I could grieve in private. I was extracted from my daily life. I didn't have any demands. I have a very small family here in Pittsburgh, and most of them are were gone by the time I was doing this work. I have one dear cousin who lives here, Krista Postai, and she has daughters, and that's the extent of my family of origin. Um, so I didn't, I say that so that I 
you know that I wasn't spending my time here like visiting family all over the place. I was really, um, you know, n spending time with my emotive state. Uh, and then the incredible historical resources you have here, including the Special Collections Library at the University, which is amazing, the Genealogical Library inside Pittsburgh Library, and the Pittsburgh Library itself. Amazing volunteers and people helped me, and then local historians like Jerry and JT and even Linda, who provided a picture of this place that was uh, helped it come alive. Um, and I felt by the end of it, and I still feel an inexplicable tie to this place. And it's funny. I grew up in Minnesota, but I never quite felt like I belonged in Minnesota. <laughs> and, and yet I can't quite claim Kansas because I'm not from here. Um, but having spent several years visiting here often, I do feel this is a home for me, uh, even though I don't live here. <laughs> Welcome back. Thank you. <laughs> um, and, it, and I haven't been here since before COVID. So that's been about four years. Um, and it, it always happens right when I pass Fort Scott. Um, this time I, got, I just started to get choked up. It's like uh, there's something about the land here that is really deep in my bones. So I'm just going to read a little bit from the book to give you a flavor. I'm going to read a historical section. And it has to do with my relatives. I figured I didn't need to read about the history of Pittsburgh. But one other thing I'll say is that once I got into the history of Pittsburgh, wow, <laughs> um, there's just, it's such a rich history. And I wrote pages and pages and pages of material that is not in this book. Um, it just isn't, it just didn't belong. This book is in three parts, and the middle gets into a history. Uh, some readers are frustrated by that. Um, but m for the most part, I think readers have appreciated kind of learning about a place and understanding a geography for kind of a, a subtext. Uh, all right, so I'll just read about the two grandfathers since they are the ones who arrived in Pittsburgh first. My first relative arrived in Pittsburgh in 1882. William Lemiel Patterson, my great-grandfather, jostled southward on a train from Iowa. He was Midwestern born and bred, raised in an upper class home, but had a pioneer's restlessness. While higher education had been a part of most of his ancestors' lives, he hadn't taken much formal school hadn't taken as much formal schooling as his parents desired. Instead, new frontiers and money beckoned. It's a, Patterson, a pattern I trace throughout the Patterson line. From one generation to the next, men following a reckless path of wealth through legitimate and illegitimate means. They were lawyers, bankers, and politicians, but they were also gamblers, gold diggers, and salesmen. My great-grandfather went west for a few, few years first. I have a copy of the diary he kept for exactly 13 months in 1877 when he staked a claim in Deadwood, South Dakota at the age of 21. Prospecting in the Black Hills back then was a young man's game, and when reading his diary entries, I get the feeling at, of being at the beginning of something. I hear the voice of a man who wants to take a risk, to gamble, to get his hands dirty. I can also hear that he's fallen under the spell of the frontier, a word that originally meant boundary, but over time slipped into, slipped, slipped into usage as an adjective, a noun, an American myth. He had the privilege and the means, more or less, to adventure, to fail, to be an iconoclast. Reading his diary, however, you'd have the impression that his economic future depended on striking it rich. We have been at work on our claim just two weeks and have somewhat near 25 cents each, but when we didn't, our expenses for grub and pick and sharpening, we are all less than $14 a piece. This must 
pan, this must pan and better than that again Saturday, or this child starts for Fort Pier, he writes. Even though he was young, he was already showing signs of physical weakness. Many days he made the sick list and was left behind in the camp to make some and loop the fires, keep them red hot. And the claim he and his co companions, Hank, Eli, and Custer, made never paid off. Over several months in the winter, they struck many pits in the hills, stripping and sluicing in the snow without much profit. By late April, the men had given up. They walked to Deadwood looking for work, and when that didn't succeed, they left on a train for Fort Pierre. There, they sold their firearms for $31, to some pilgrims they think, that are, they think that are going to make fortunes in the hills. On May 9th, 1877, my great-grandfather wrote his last diary entry. We have made arrangements with a carpenter to make us a boat for $14 to be done in the morning by five o'clock if the steamboat doesn't make an appearance before that time. We expect to be four days in getting to Yankton, some 340 miles. And all of our readers who want to follow us through our hardships and trials will find us in our last edition, down the Missouri. My maternal great-grandfather, James Kirkpatrick, McCluskey arrived in Pittsburgh from Scotland in 1887, although there's a chance he traveled by way of Pennsylvania, where his brother lived as a coal miner. He spent the rest of his life digging coal. His sons, all but my grandfather, the youngest of nine, followed him into the mines. The family first settled in Fleming, a mining camp about six miles southwest of town, and lived in at least three other camps before they were finally able to afford a move to Pittsburgh, nearly two decades after James began working the mines. My grandfather, William Ronald McCluskey, was born in Yale, a camp a few miles northeast of Pittsburgh, close to the Missouri border. Early photographs show a desolate place with dirt roads and stubby trees. Camp houses, or more appropriately shacks, stood along rectangular lines of a survey, presenting a dull, uniform appearance. One reporter for a socialist newspaper described them in detail. Coal soot has blackened the walls and ceilings of the miners' homes, she wrote or ragged paper flutters from the walls. Through the broken roof and frail sides, the rains ruin the few possessions of the miner's family and drip down on his wretched bed. These camps proved temporary. As coal diminished, mines were closed and dismantled, and new ones opened in expanding coal fields. Miners frequently moved from mine to mine and camp to camp, Houses, shacks, and other buildings were disassembled and moved on railroad bed flat cars or huge wagons pulled by mules. At each new site, the buildings were lined up in rows, dirt surfaced roads and streets springing up between them. Immigrant families endured terrible living and working conditions. And the number of mining injuries and deaths were common, overwhelming. Workers faced terrible conditions, cave-ins, falling rock, explosions, noxious gases, exposed shafts that were hundreds of feet deep, and unsafe levels of dust. Workers were paid about $2 a day, le leaving families with little to subsist on. Many farmed and cared for livestock in their free time. Others hunted and fished in the stream near the mines and some took up bootlegging to subsidize their family income. The consumption of whiskey in the camps was considerable. The state's prohibition laws meant liquor had to be distilled in secret, leading to increased criminality. The unruly reputation of the coal fields became so acute that Walter Stubbs, governor from 1909 to 1913, declared I might as well be governor of the Balkans.
over time, the coal camps would become known as the Little Balkans, as I learned in my research on Edward. It's a name that persists today. The Little Balkan Days, an annual Labor Day festival in Pittsburgh, draws thousands to pay homage to the region's history, ethnic diversity, and community spirit. So do you want to do a question and answer? Does anyone have any questions? JT? Um, you described yourself as a poet first, yeah. right? Yes. Right. And I'm, I'm interested in if that was part of the intersection with why you took the approach of uh, writing about your father's death and your grandfather's death kind of a creative nonfiction point of view. Did that have yes. an intersection? Yes. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? About and JT is a poet, for those who don't know. <laughs> um, so I think I said I didn't start any of this research imagining I would write a book. And my, my own particular interest in poetry by the time I was writing this book was not to be autobiographical, was not even really to be narrative. I was interested in sort of abstraction and sonic value in poems. And that's partly because of the family I grew up in. They're not storytellers. They're silent. I always knew I wanted to be a writer. Um, and there's something about the brevity of poetry, but also that it, you can be illogical in a poem, and you don't have to write about yourself unless you want to. No one's expecting you to, you know. Um, all those things allowed me to move into poetry deeply. And when my father died, one of the first things I started to do was to write. And I didn't imagine, I mean, I don't know. I, I didn't write poems. I was sort of journaling and then doing this research. And so it, I started to write very slowly over time, moving away from journaling into kind of a into a prose document. <laughs> and it wasn't until I saw the sinkhole that I th heard a voice in my head that said, oh, this is a book now. <laughs> you know, kind of like, oh, now I have a metaphor which will allow me to think about the narrative or think about the story. I don't know if I'm answering your question. Well, when you're but about, you know, you're, I could have written a straight nonfiction. Of your father yeah. And your grandfather. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. I see. So there's three passages in the book where I imagine um, the last day of each man, and I am trying to imagine being in their mind state. So one of the things that happens in this whole process is that I'm deeply curious and interested in um, the phenomena of suicide, and I read extensive books. Um, some of them quite clinical about suicide. I know, I know it's not a pleasant topic, but I did that because I was trying to understand as much as I possibly could about, about the suicidal mind. And I think it's really an impossible task. I think we can't really know. And for those of us left behind by suicide, you know, that's the thing that plagues you. You're stuck with an avalanche of whys. Um, you want to understand. It's very hard to understand. So um, that's partly where it comes from. I was also in a suicide survivors group, and one of the rituals we had in that group was to um, periodically tell the story of the day of our loved one's death from our perspective. And the theory behind that is to create a narrative to move beyond the trauma state. Right? We also had a ritual of lighting a candle for our loved one and saying their name at the beginning of each meeting. And I very quickly began saying my grandfather's names because I felt like I was also mourning them, even though they were very distant um, in my mourning of my father. And so telling the story of my own day <laughs> led me to be curious about my father's day 
and, and uh, the passage that opens the book was written um, fairly early after his death. And it's me just trying to imagine what he did. This is, I guess, how I process things. And because I had that passage, I decided to also do that exercise for my grandparents. Again, no idea that I was writing a book. This is just private writing. <laughs> and once I had the manuscript together, I t decided to tuck those into the story. And I had early readers say to me, I think you even said this, early readers say those passages are, you have to keep them. I had ethical and moral questions about, um, first of all, a lot of psychologists say, you know, we need to be mindful about writing about suicide. They worry about copycat syndrome. They worry about being too graphic. Uh, and I understand deeply all those arguments. And at the same time, I felt like I wanted to somehow look this head on. And I, but I also wanted the reader to kind of encounter these men, you know? not just telling a history like I sort of just read, where you're, you're sort of encountering them, but many readers told me those passages have to stay, and I just trusted them. And then my editor also agreed. And so that's, uh, the, but it is, um, in the realm of creative nonfiction, they're fictionalized, obviously, but they're based on fact, and they're based on a lot of research, believe it or not. <laughs> um, so. To me, they are true, and they're speculative. And there's a big divide about whether writers should be allowed to do that under the realm of creative nonfiction. But as a poet, I lean, I lean into the side of the imagination and creative possibility. Yeah. <laughs> Laura, and then, or? Trina had a question. Okay. That's a really interesting question. No. <laughs> and I didn't even realize today is the 17th, so thank you. I think that it wasn't important before my father died. I started to try to unearth meaning, and I think I say later in the book, <coughs> excuse me, this is common for people in grief. They're looking for signs and symbols as a way to understand. Again, I think that's a very poetic um, kind of approach. But um, I, I think I ultimately was puzzling. I don't write this in the book, but puzzling about why today. It was a week before Christmas, which was kind of awful, um, really awful, actually. Yeah. Well, these are things we'll never know. but. Probably trying to stay away from being too close to Christmas, right? My mother was having uh, cataract surgery and had just recovered. So I think he had to wait, since he was planning, I think he had to wait until that was resolved. So unfortunately, it did butt up right against Christmas. Um, and I have to, you know, I'll be honest, like it basically ruined Christmas for a good seven or eight years. I'm, I'm past that feeling now, but it took a long time. Yeah. Laura. Oh, I wondered if it changed your poetry. <laughs> I mean, the writing of it. I imagine, though I've only written um, three or four poems in the process of writing this book, and I'm a very single-minded writer. I don't have multiple projects going at once, so that's not unusual. Mm -hmm. But the, la the last few poems I've written are more prosy. <laughs> they're, they're built around sentences, which is not what I was doing before. So I do feel like my voice has shifted, and, um, and I'm dabbling in a long essay. So I'm not sure uh, what that means. So sentences, who Sen knows if you'll get personal? I know, right? <laughs> I know. And that's a really big question, actually. Yeah. different subject altogether. Your ties to Southeast Kansas. You mentioned the Pittsburgh Pottery. I know there's two people in this room who have been in the Pittsburgh Pottery. 
JT worked there as a high school kid. And I knew the Matrousy family here in Frontenac, and my dad was very close to him. In fact, one of the young sons was our confirmation sponsor. Yeah. And I was in the Pittsburgh Pottery, and we can attest. Amazing. It was a very hot place. Very hot. Yeah. Very hot. I went to see the site before they completely cleaned it up, and I can imagine. The Matrazi, am I saying that name correctly? Matrazi, yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that was right after my grandfather's time there. Yeah. By family accounts, again, this was hard to substantiate. Um, there were a lot of Italian workers, and I imagine maybe that's related to this family, and they went on strike. Um, and they wanted to earn more money. And my grandfather supposedly came home and wept at the kitchen table, but decided to just shutter the pottery as the manager um, and walk away. And then yeah. I think they took it over. Yeah, and you were <laughs> talking about how little most of Kansas knows about Southeast Kansas. Two different cultures. Yes. Most of Kansas was populated by the Civil War. A lot of New Englanders. Sure. Yeah. Okay, that Here makes is Lynn County because I taught up there and I was like a foreigner in yeah. Lynn County because they were still Lincoln Republicans <laughs> at the time I was there. And uh, the languages yeah. that were here in Frontenac and Pittsburgh. Something like seventy-five yeah. different well, I languages. Think the the Frontenac book different. Says thirty-four, 34 different, languages. different languages. Yeah. 30. I mean, it's staggering yeah, yeah. And, and what yeah and I do think it's unusual that there's many families multiple generations who've stayed here I think that's unusual yeah you know uh, in Kansas and and even in rural America we came across some of Gene Goodson's uh, research if not he was the premier researcher who probably he helped set up the special collection oh sure yes yes library. yes but I was talking to him one time. He had a theory about the people from all these different cultures who left their homeland and came here, you know, to work. That it took a certain personality and a certain DNA that they yeah. passed along to one another. Yeah. You know, as, and it, it runs all the way from the kind of stick to it is the thing we say here is hard work, take care of your neighbor. Yeah. And that carried through. Yeah. Also, there's a great amount of creativity. Yeah. Yeah. In this area. Mm -hmm. You know, it's that it's that brought with it uh, in those 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 uh, risk takers, people who took off. So that's another theory. But Linda can tell you more because she goes all around the state. I know. And does presentations on the Amazon Army. I know. At the end of every pr I work roadie. At the end of every presentation, says. I didn't know anything about this. <laughs> you know, and it's because, as Linda said, she fought to get it in the history books. Mm -hmm. They weren't even talking about no. it in Kansas history. Yeah. That, that history is so rich. I, got, I went down a really deep dive with the Amazon army and with that period of um, the labor, how it, and all those characters, and also the socialism that was here. It's just amazing. And I, I think I've already said, like... Um, <laughs> I had to cut material out. I mean, I, I, I had to decide, like, what am I doing now? Am I writing a history of Pittsburgh? Um, I had the press who took my book, there are two editors who are at play, and one editor really wanted to um, expand the history of Pittsburgh from what I had originally had, and the other editor wanted to make it go away. Um, luckily, my ed the editor who acquired the book was the one who wanted to expand. And she said, you know, you can sh make your decision. I'll stand behind you. But I really think you should expand the history. And I did. And I'm grateful. So I ended up putting more back in. Um, but it was a real challenge because I wanted, and I was just at the Kansas Book Festival. And people, there were a couple people who knew Pittsburgh. And they said, well, did you get the bootlegging in? Did you get the mafia rumors in there? Did you get this in there? And I'm like, Actually, I did. I, I guess I did a pretty good job because there are these stories that circulate um, and the mafia story. And I got my earful at the book festival again of more stories that, you know, I um, 
I don't know what to think about all of that, but they are still out there circulating. And they, they tell you these firsthand accounts of somebody who knocks on their door and hands them a paper bag and things like that. It's wild. strikes me is that scene that with your dad being so meticulous and getting his notebook ready for yeah. your mother for the future on things that had to be laid down. Mm -hmm. And then your grandfather, very family centered men in a lot of ways for the for their era. Yes. And your father. Yes. What can you what come to terms with you know, what a the caring thing to do. Yeah, I in the middle of chaos. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one of the things I was thinking about deeply, and it's only really just briefly mentioned in the book, is, um, well, again, we're spanning 100 years. So we have Edward and William coming of age in a d completely different era than my father. But um, the implications of gender and how culturally gender influences people over time. And I think, and I'm speculating about my grandfather's, but um, my cousin has helped establish some facts, at least around my <coughs> mother's side of the family, because he was still alive. And she's eight years older than I am. So her memory, you know, she was almost a teenager when she knew, when he died. Um, it, that all of these three men probably have that really deep sort of stick to itness. The Patterson side's Irish Catholic, need I say more? Uh, and <laughs> the other side is Scottish Presbyterian, um, and then coal miners, right? I mean, that side of the family is really tough. Although interestingly, when the mines declined, that family really dispersed all the his brothers went to other mining opportunities, so they all left Kansas, except for William. Um, I think all three of these men had a streak of creativity, number one. William got the closest maybe to touching it by working at the pottery. I think for him that was, he actually wanted to be a potter, like a, like a fine arts potter in 19... <laughs> 49. I mean, so, you know, he at least was in, um, but a, a highly sensitive people, very emotional people, and yet the family culture is like not to talk. So that's just a recipe for disaster. And then coming of age in a culture where that is not supported in men, um, I think had long term effects. With my father, I think it's pretty easy to see there was a big wound for him as a child that he never was able to address or was not supported in addressing and could never recover from. And that, that I think, was a burning underneath. And there's, like, statistically people, children specifically of parents who die by suicide have a 46% higher chance of dying by suicide. Yeah. Now there's some really new research that has shown that there is a genetic component. And when you have this gene, again, you have a 46% chance higher of, of dying this way. So those were questions I just couldn't answer. I tried, but um, I don't know the answer to your question. Um, I think that caringness comes from that deep sensitivity and um, deep emotional qualities I think that I see in all three of these men. And I would say Edward, who is a kind of a chaotic character, but his, I think he drove it all into work. And some of the accounts that you read of him as a politician, even at the national level, he appeared to be a very charismatic, and he's not a senator, he's in the House of Representatives, but he appeared to have, you know, deep loyal allies and also everyone listened to him because he really had some kind of mojo. <laughs> and believed 
passionately in rights of workers and right. in social justice at a he time. He must have been loved in this area. He's had to be. He was. He was. He loved by the workers all the way up. Yeah. He, I've stumbled on an archive of his political papers that my grandmother collected and is at Wichita State University, which no family member had ever revealed to me. Um, and there's a lot of wonderful stories in that archive that are in partisan papers, so it's hard to know the accuracy, but there's stories of him standing on the streets of Pittsburgh and handing out $5 bills. There's stories of, because he was rich now, right? He was a, a, a councilman. And there's stories of him being at union hall meetings where he stands up on a table and you know delivers a speech and everyone screams and hollers and um, he was really kind of on fire. Also an alcoholic and a gambler and <laughs> all the other things. But uh, and he had red hair and people described that you know he had this real intensity about him. Any other questions? Were you able to uncover anything about how your grandmother felt the death of her husband? That's such a, I was just, I just met briefly with my cousin, you know, before I came here. And she said, you know, I don't have to remind you, but I'm going to remind you that, um, no, these women never talked about it. So we don't know. We don't know. They never talked about it. Um, and, you know, that's a big question I have, too, that these women, um, and I, I write about them very briefly. I need to write about them more because they lived in the same place and through the same conditions. They did not die in this manner, and the fact that they all survived this is important, extraordinary, strong women, very strong and willful women, I would say. Um, but we were just talking about my mother's mo mother, who uh, my cousin was very close to, and she said, you know, I would ask questions you know, toward the end, like, you're going to, it's... <laughs> You know, sometimes people want to talk about things before they die, and she had nothing, nothing to say. I think for her it was an enormous wound, too. That she, they never, ever married again. No, they never married again. Yeah. It's really interesting. I that only, not that it's in a similar I, way, That's unusual. My, my grandfathers, yeah. in both my families, my grandfathers, wives, my grandmothers both died in childbirth, and each was left to raise nine children. Amazing, yeah. Well, one grandmother was in 40, and the other was 67. Um, yeah, that's amazing, yeah. Thank you all for being here. <laughs> and thank you so much for thank you. the invitation. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we are uh, going to allow Juliet now to have a seat, maybe, and, and if you'd like to uh, buy a book or have her sign a book of um, yeah. her choosing, which I think will be. Uh, we know what sinkhole is. Uh, you can step up and do that. We also have refreshments in the back, and please stay and, and visit um, with each other and, and with her. And we're very, very pleased that you that you came here and that you, um, you know, you're quite a talent. It's mm -hmm. wonderful to uh, see that talent materialize. <laughs> um, we also, moving on, you know, our next exhibit, the exhibit that's up now with Jerry and I will be down next Saturday. And October 1 will be uh, Croatia. We're going to celebrate mm -hmm. the Croatia. Heritage, heritage of Croatia. And we, we do a different um, yeah, uh, nationality or a different country um, on a cycle. So that's what we're going to, and Phyllis Bittner will be heading that, hosting that. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll also have a program later into October for that particular um, um, exhibit. 
So thank you very much, and please have something to eat or drink, and come up and talk yeah, to Julia. Yeah, we'll talk to you.